Hello, future RMTs. Welcome to our virtual classroom, version 2.0. Okay. And in this lecture, what we're going to discuss is all about carbohydrates and the disorders no, of our carbohydrate metabolism. Our learning outcomes are as follows. Number one is explain the metabolism of carbohydrates in the body. Explain the modes of actions of hormones in carbohydrate metabolism. Evaluate laboratory results in diagnosing carbohydrate-related disorders. Okay. To start with, let us have a review of what is a carbohydrate. Okay. Remember guys, that carbohydrate is a, an, an example of an organic compound which is primarily composed of carb, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. If we are going to take a look with the general structure of our carbohydrates, we can say that our carbohydrates is or contains no, uh, aldehyde and ketones as the functional group. We have here aldos and the ketones as the basic exam example or the, the basic unit of our carbohydrates or sugars. Aldose, from the word itself, aldose, no, it contains an aldehyde as the functional group and ketose, ketone. Now, like what I've said, uh, ketones and aldehydes contains both, or both of them has what we call the carbonyl group. Right? This is actually the carbonyl group. And when we said carbonyl group, that is carbon having a double bond with oxygen. Now, the only difference between aldehyde and ketones is that the functional group or the uh, carbonyl group is on the terminal side for aldehyde and for ketones we have it on the middle of the chain okay so this is the general formula of our carbohydrate cx h2o and y now remember that if you still remember the photosynthesis no we have carbon dioxide plus water will give us our glucose and excess oxygen okay uh, we have definitions or categories no, of our carbohydrates based on structure. We have monosaccharides, we have disaccharides, we have oligosaccharides, we have polysaccharides. Okay? Now, remember that when we said monosaccharides, that is the simplest unit of our sugar, of our glucose, and it can be further hydrolyzed or simplified. Now, when we said disaccharide, it is combination of a two monosaccharides. And the link between these two monosaccharides is what we call the glycosidic linkage. Now, we have oligosaccharides. No, when you said oligosaccharides, that is composed of two to 10 uh, sugar units. And when we said polysaccharides, it has many monosaccharide units. Okay, so too much on that. Uh, just that uh, it's just nice to know. No, it's just nice to know. Okay, uh, what we're going to give on emphasis and on focus is the metabolism itself. Now remember, guys, that glucose is the primary source of energy. No. That is the ultimate source of energy, not only by our liver, not only by our muscle, not only by the tissues or the cells that we have in the body, but also the primary source of energy of our nervous system. That's why it is important for us to have a steady state of our uh, glucose level in our extracellular fluid. Why? Why it is important to have a steady state of glucose level in our extracellular fluid because remember our cell, central nervous system or if our our nervous system depends on the glucose as its source of energy Ngayon, remember that our central nervous system or our nervous system is not capable of concentrating or storing glucose that's why they depend majority or they depend mainly on the extracellular fluid the glucose that is in the extracellular fluid okay now remember 
when the carbohydrates in the extracellular fluid or ECF depletes, then that's the time for our central nervous system not to lose its primary source of energy. Now, since it loses the primary source of energy, it means there will be an alteration or our nervous system cannot perform its major function or its function. That's why if you experience a hypoglycemia, you will have a impaired judgment, you will have a impaired uh, memory no? because of the loss of source of our nervous system sa kanyang energy. Now, I have here, we have here the things that I want you to remember in the metabolism of our glucose. Remember guys that the glucose metabolism is mainly affected by hormones. Okay? There are there are several hormones. There are at least seven hormones that is responsible in the metabolism of our glucose. Now, take note. Number one is during a fasting state, the blood glucose level is kept constant by mobilizing the glycogen stores in the liver. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean? In, in, in fasting state, you are deprived to take any food. But you are allowed to drink. You are allowed to consume water. But you are deprived to consume any type of food or any liquid except for water. Meaning to say, since that you are deprived to take water, uh, I'm sorry, you are deprived to take food, which is the source of our energy, means that there is a decreasing supply of glucose in the body, decreasing supply of carbohydrates in the body. Thus, now it will affect the glucose level. Ngayon, the mechanism of the body is the stored glycogen in the liver will be synthesized or will be metabolized as the source of energy. This will be promoted by the hormone glucagon. Okay? Sa glucagon, ang principal action niya is to increase the glucose level through the synthesis of our glycogen that is stored in our liver. Okay? Magkakamiran tayo ng tinatawag na ano? We could have the, the glyconeogenesis or gluconeogenesis because of the effect of the glucagon. No, to, to use up our stored glycogen. But the problem is, if the fasting is too long, no, prolonged fasting na, or nag-starvation ka na, nag-gutom ka na, no, uh, gluconeogenesis is required. Papasok na dyan sa gluconeogenesis. That is through the help of the hormone glucagon. Remember, glucagon increases or enhances or initiates no, the gluconeogenesis. Again, remember guys, when we said gluconeogenesis, that is the formation of glucose 6-phosphate from non-carbohydrate sources. Okay. Si glyconeogenesis, uh, si glyco, I'm sorry, si glycogenesis is the breakdown of glycogen. That is also initiated by, by the glucagon. Okay, so si glycogen will be break will be uh, break down to glu glucose for the source of energy. Kasi nga meron meron kang nagfa-fasting ka. Ngayon, let's say the glucagon that you stored is already used up. Nagamit mo na lahat because you can only use glycogen for approximately 24 to 48 hours. Okay? Hanggang dalawang araw ka lang pwedeng magutom. At yung katawan mo, kayong i-compensate yung loss na energy mo by metabolizing or by breaking your glycogen into glucose through the help of enzyme glucagon in the process of what we call glyconeogenesis. Glycogenolysis. 
Now, in case that there is already you used up already, then we have what we call the gluconeogenesis. Okay, the purpose of that is to use the non-carbohydrate uh, macromolecules in the body to be converted on to form glucose 6-phosphate as the source of our energy. Now, remember guys that greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter of our fasting blood sugar is considered as hyperglycemic and less than 50 milligrams per deciliter is considered as hypoglycemic. Okay? Uh, like what I've said, there are principal hormones. Now, there are seven. Now, the, the two will be discussed later. There are seven hormones that are important no? in the metabolism of our glucose. Number one of which, which I know that all of you are aware, is the insulin. No? That is the most common or the most known, the well-known hormone responsible for the metabolism of glucose. Now, what is the insulin? Okay, see insulin, I want you to remember, guys, that insulin is produced no, or, or synthesized. It is synthesized by the beta cells. Okay? It is synthesized by the beta cells of the islets of the longer hand cells. Okay? Uh, longer. Longer hands cells of our pancreas. Okay, si pancreas, yung major endocrine organ natin, that is responsible for the synthesis of our insulin. Now, what is the major function of our insulin? Okay, again, this is the primary hormone responsible for the entry of glucose into the cells. Why? There is an important for us, uh, why there is a need for glucose to enter into cells. Para to maintain the glucose level in our extracellular fluid. No? And it means, no, it means that there will be a source of energy. Okay? Now remember that the release of insulin causes increased movement of glucose in the cells and increased glucose metabolism. Okay? Kasi yun nga yung major function niya eh. Responsible for the entry of glucose into the cell. So pag mayroong increased movement of glucose in the cell, nagagawa po ni insulin ang kanyang function. And if that is uh, maintained, then there will be a homeostasis in the level of our glucose level. Now remember, yeah, remember this one, cellular glucose uptake. Okay, ex uh, uh, the entry of glucose in the cells. Now, the site of action is in M. When you said M, that's muscle. And A is in the adipose tissues. Okay? Uh, insulin also promotes protein synthesis. Okay? Insulin also promotes protein synthesis as well as fatty acids and triglyceride synthesis. Okay? Bakit? No, it promotes lipogenesis, the conversion of carbohydrates into fatty acids. Ito po yan. No, that's why fatty acid synthesis. And at the same time, no, it inhibits glycogenolysis. Why? Why? Why we have to inhibit that? Okay, you know, ini inhibit niya. Binababa niya yung dini decrease yung function ng glycogenolysis. Uh, genolysis at saka gluconeogenesis. Diba sabi natin, these two pathway or these two processes is the formation of glucose if, or formation of glucose, yeah, and energy if you are on the starv uh, starvation or you are on the fasting state. Kasi, meron kang decrease supply of glucose. So, these two will do the function not through the help of the uh, hormone glucagon. Kaya sabi natin, the action of insulin and glucagon is opposite. Why? 
Si insulin, ang primary purpose niya to maintain or to metabolize glucose so that insulin uh, so that glucose will 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 be on the normal state so that glucose is not uh, abnormal or that the level of glucose is normal we metabolize ni insulin eh no through the cellular uptake glycogen synthesis no protein synthesis and fatty acid and triglyceride synthesis but since no since ang action ng glucagon is to increase glucose na inhibit ni insulin. Bakit ini-inhibit ni insulin ang action ng glucagon? Because insulin is enough. Insulin is capable to let the glucose enter into the cell so that the cell will be metabolized. Uh, the glucose in the cell will be metabolized as the source of energy. Now, in cases that there is a problem in our insulin, no, edi yung makupromote ito mga tinatawag nating uh, glyco uh, genolysis, genolysis, gluconeogenesis, ketogenesis, and lipolysis, which are the functions of our glucagon. I, I hope you can follow. And I hope that you can see the difference between insulin and glucagon. Now, take note that insulin is our natural hypo glycemic agent. It's a natural hypoglycemic agent. Okay? And take note that that is the only hormone that is capable of decreasing glucose levels. Okay? That is the only hormone that is responsible for the uh, decreasing glucose level. Now, how about glucagon? So, glucagon naman is the primary hormone responsible for increasing glucose level. If insulin is produced or synthesized in the beta cells of the islets of the longer hand cells of the pancreas, si glucagon naman is synthesized by the alpha cells. Okay. Insulin B, B, ba, 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 hypoglycemic agent. Glucagon, A, alpha, aangat. Okay? Aangat, tataas ang ating glucose level. Okay? Now, remember that the glucagon acts by increasing plasma glucose level. How can glucagon increase the plasma glucose level? by what we call uh, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. In this process, we use our stored glycogen. Okay? And our liver is the primary organ to do that. Now, let's say in case that glycogen is already used up, what will happen? The, the, glyco, the glucagon will promote gluconeogenesis okay gluconeogenesis now why is it that this insulin or that this uh, glucagon will promote ketogenesis and lipolysis diba sabi natin uh, gluconeogenesis will will use or this the, this is a metabolic process that will use non carbohydrate compound let's say for example fats or proteins these fats or proteins once synthesized or once metabolized through the help of our glucagon, what will happen? There will be a formation of ketones. That's why we have what we call the ketogenesis. Okay. Why is it glucagon increases lipolysis? Ano po ibig sabihin ng lipolysis? We are decomposing fats. Why do we have to decompose fats? Because there is in need no, for the stored fats to be the source of energy because the primary source of energy, which is the glucose, is being impaired. Mababa. Alright? Now, we have here adrenaline. Adrenaline is a hormone, uh, of, of course, hormone that will promote 
uh, glyco glycogenolysis and lipolysis. Okay. We have growth hormone. A growth hormone is also responsible for uh, lipolysis and glycogenolysis. Now, how about cortisol? Now, remember, guys, that cortisol is what? This is a uh, glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids. So, when you said glucocorticoids, that is a steroid hormone. No? That is a glucocortico uh, glucocorticoids. No? Example of glucocorticoids is our cortisol. Now, take note, guys, that cortisol increases plasma glucose by decreasing the intestinal entry of uh, glucose into the cells. Okay? And increasing uh, gluconeogenesis in the liver and glycogen synthesis also in the liver. Okay? As well as lipolysis. So, generally, our cortisol has an increased effect on our gluconeogenesis and glycogen synthesis in the liver, and we have the proteolysis in the muscle. Okay. Now, how, how come that the cortisol will have an effect? Paano masisecrete ni adrenal gland si cortisol natin? Well, of course, it will be secreted, or the adrenal cortex will secrete our uh, cortisol through the help of the hormone, no? a chemical messenger, ACTH. ACTH is produced by our uh, anterior pituitary gland. Now, ACTH is known as our uh, overall. Okay? I want you to take note that this is the overall regulator of uh, adrenal gland. Okay. Bakit? ACTH will promote the production or the secretion of glucocorticoids as well as the mineral corticoids by the adrenal medulla. No? And that's why it is associated and uh, that's why hyperglycemia is associated in patients with what we call Cushing's syndrome and Cushing's disease which is true with cortisol. Why? Because the fats stored is being used up and converted into glucose. Okay. Now, how about uh, growth hormone? Okay. Growth hormone is responsible for uh, glyco glycogenolysis and lipolysis. So, growth hormone is also produced by our anterior pituitary gland. And the major function of growth hormones for the metabolism. And that metabolism is one I think glucose metabolism. Okay. Uh, well, the next one, the other, the other hormones you know, we have is the FNFrin. Uh, yeah, I will write here FNFrin. FNFrin. Yeah. Now, ano naman yung function ni FNFrin? Take note that epinephrine produced by the adrenal medulla okay, increases, okay, this increases plasma glucose level. Okay, this increases plasma glucose level. Why? Why, why in epinephrine increases the plasma glucose level? It, in, uh, it increases plasma glucose level because it inhibits, inhibits, okay? It inhibits what? It inhibits the uh, function of our pancreas to secrete insulin. In other words, epinephrine inhibits insulin secretion. Okay, since uh, uh, insulin is the secretion of insulin is inhibited. Therefore, as we said, insulin is the only hormone responsible to decrease our glucose. At di magkakameron tayo ng hyper 
glycemia. Okay? Now, how about tyroxine? Tyroxine is a hormone produced by our uh, thyroid gland. No? Tyroxine is produced by the thyroid gland. Now, what is the major function of tyroxine? Okay, it stimulates glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Therefore, it increases glucose absorption in the intestine. Okay, next. How about somatostin? Oh, in other words, tyroxine is also a hyperglycemic hormone. Okay? Now, how about somatostatin? Sino naman po itong somatostatin na ito? Somatostatin is a hormone secreted by the delta cells, okay? by the delta cells of the pancreas. Okay? By the delta cells of the islets of the pancreas. Ano na? Ang ginagawa ni somatostatin. Somatostatin inhibits also the action of insulin. No? It inhibits the actions of insulin. Okay? Which resulted into increased plasma glucose. Now, what is the relationship between insulin and somatostatin. Now take note that somatostatin, somatostatin, is what? This is a antagonist, antagonist of our insulin. Bakit? Iniinhibit niya eh. Pinipigilan niya yung function ni insulin. Okay? Therefore, we can say that somatostatin has an antagonistic effect to our glucose. Si insulin at saka si glucagon, they have the opposite effect. Insulin decreases or normalizes the glucose level. Glucagon increases the glucose level. Now, there is a reciprocal control of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis in the liver. Okay? Now, take note, guys. Insulin released in the fed state stimulates the expression of phosphofructokinase. I repeat, uh, insulin released during the fed state stimulates the expression of Phosphofructokinase. Now, what will happen? Pyruvate kinase and enzyme and the enzyme responsible for the synthesis of uh, fructose 6 uh, fructose 2 6 by phosphate. Okay. Then, what will happen? Glycolysis is promoted and gluconeogenesis is inhibited. Again, I repeat. No? I repeat. There is a reciprocal control for glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Again, if the insulin is secreted at the fed state, kakakain mo lang. Kumain ka, na-detect ng katawan mo that you have to secrete insulin so that this will be uh, the glucose that you intake, the carbohydrates that you intake will be metabolized. I, go, I hope you can follow. So, ano mangyayari? Stimulate si insulin, i-release si insulin so that it will stimulate the expression of this enzyme, phosphofructokinase. Okay. Pyruvate kinase and the enzyme responsible for the synthesis of F to uh, fructose 2,6 by phosphate. Therefore, glycolysis will be promoted. Since glycolysis will be promoted, what will happen? Gluconeogenesis 
is inhibited. Ngayon, let's say that glucagon is released during a fasting state. Sige nyo sabihin, released siya at fed state. Kumain ka eh. Kailangan ng insulin. Okay, si glucagon, which will promote gluconeogenesis, no, is released on the fasting state. Ano naman yung mangyayari? Okay. Glucagon inhibits the expression of the enzymes and stimulates the production of phosphonyl pyruvate carboxylase and fructose 1,6 biphosphate, uh, biphosphatase. Therefore, gluconeogenesis is stimulated, glycolysis is inhibited. In other words, magkabalikad nga sila. They are opposite. That's why we have the word reciprocal. Okay. So that is the action of our insulin and glucagon. Okay. So that is the uh, reciprocal effect of our insulin during the fed state and glucagon during the fasting state. So that there will be a production of glucose as the major source of our energy. Now, what are the effects of insulin and glucagon? Now, we have here a summary of the effects of insulin and glucagon. Okay? So when we said I negative, it, in, it means inhibitory action of insulin. When we said I positive, stimulating action of insulin. G positive stimulating action of glucagon. Now in the liver, no, in the liver, uh, inhibitory action of insulin, stimulating action of glucagon is what we call the ketogen uh, ketogenesis. Now, if there is a ketogenesis, bakit nagkameron ng ketogenesis? Because we use up our fatty fats, uh, lipids as the source of energy. These are non-carbohydrate compounds. Okay? These are non-carbohydrate compo compounds that is stimulated by our liver, uh, that is stimulated rather by our glucagon in the liver. So there will be a formation of ketones and ketone bodies will be seen. Okay? Ketone bodies will be seen in urine or in blood. Okay? Ketonuria and ketonemia. Ketonuria in blood, uh, in urine rather, and ketonemia in blood. Okay? So these ketone bodies will serve as the energy in our muscle. Okay, next. Uh, breakdown of glycogen. The breakdown of glycogen is initiated or stimulated by glucagon. Once this glucagon, uh, glycogen rather, is breakdown or stimulated, no, the, the metabolism of glycogen is stimulated by glucagon, it will produce glucose. Okay? Again, our gluconeogenesis is also uh, stimulated by glucagon. Therefore, it will also produce glucose. Now, once this glucose is synthesized now by our, uh, through the help of our insulin, it will be stored as glycogen. And once this glycogen is need, uh, needed to be used as the energy, then it will be converted into our glucose. Next. Uh, these proteins, no, the use of proteins as the source of energy, okay, will will have an inhi inhibitory action of insulin. Okay, so once this amino uh, proteins will 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 undergo breakdown, it will become a amino acids. Okay, uh, these amino acids will be stimulated by our glucagon to 
undergo gluconeogenesis as a source of energy to be converted as our glucose. Now, in the adipose tissue, the triglycerides, no, the triglycerides, no, will be promoted. Okay, or will be stimulated by the action of our glucagon to undergo lipolysis as free fatty acids, okay, or as glycerol. This glycerol will be metabolized into glucose through the help of the action or through the action of our glucagon. The glucose now promotes lipogenesis through the action of our insulin. And it will be stored in our adipose tissue. So this illustration shows us you know, what is happening in our body through the help of our insulin and glucagon to maintain the normal level of glucose in the body. Now, if in case that there is an increase in the amount of glucose greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter, no? greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter, then it means that we have what we call a condition hyperglycemia. No? Greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter is a condition called hyperglycemia. Okay, so this is 5.56 or 5.5 or 5.6 millimoles per liter. Now, hyperglycemia no, increases or increase plasma glucose level. Okay, so the effect of insulin is na be, uh, being altered. As I say, sabi natin, insulin is our major hypoglycemic agent. Again, insulin enhances permeability to the cells, enhances permeability of glucose to the cells. In liver, and tissue. Yun nga lang, since that you have a problem in our insulin, na naapektuhan na yung uh, effect na yung function of insulin, that's why there is an increase in the glucose concentration. Since there is a problem in the insulin, there is an alter in the glucose metabolic pathways. So if I will go back here, okay, I will delete the, the annotations. If I will go back here, and every, the all functions of insulin, you now the actions of insulin, you have deficiency in insulin because of the problem in the secretion of insulin, then everything will be under the control of glucagon. Okay? So itataas lang ng itataas ni glucagon ang level of our glucose. That's why, no, that's why uh, keto, ketones, is, ketones is positive. No? Uh, we use the other forms of macromolecules as the source of energy because insulin is the problem in hyperglycemia. Now take note, guys, that the major cause, no, the major cause of hyperglycemia is imbalance of hormones particularly in the hormone insulin. Si insulin problem, si glucagon active. Wala nag-i-inhibit eh ng action ni glucagon kasi si insulin wala. Okay? Now, one of the conditions associated in what we call hyperglycemia is no other than diabetes mellitus. Okay? You are all aware of what is diabetes mellitus. Actually, Diabetes mellitus is a group of a metabolic disorders characterized by hyperglycemia. 
Now, what is the problem in a patient with diabetes mellitus? The problem here, there is a defect in the insulin secretion. Okay. There are two reasons kung bakit ka nagkakamaroon ng diabetes mellitus. Number one, well, well, of course, of hormonal imbalance because of the problem in the secretion of insulin or the action of insulin. What are the two major uh, uh, cause no? or two major reasons kung bakit you develop diabetes mellitus? Number one is you have a problem in the insulin secretion. Okay. You have a problem in the insulin secretion or you have an insulin or problem, a problem in insulin action or worse, both is being affected. Okay. The reason why you have a diabetes mellitus or hyperglycemia because of the insulin secretion. What is with insulin secretion? You have altered you have a uh, defect, you have problem in the secretion of our insulin. The problem in the secretion of insulin may be due to the reason of, or may be due to the problem in the beta cells of our pancreas. Or you might have the insulin, but the problem is the action. The receptors to our insulin so that the insulin will have its action. Okay. In 1979, uh, I will share my black screen. Yeah. In 1979, the National Diabetes Data Group, okay, 1979, National Diabetes, data group classified diabetes into two. We have type 1 diabetes mellitus and type 2 diabetes mellitus. We are using uh, Roman numerals. We are using Roman numerals. Now, type 1 diabetes mellitus is said to be the Insulin, I've discussed this already in clinical microscopy. Now, insulin dependent uh, diabetes mellitus. And type 2 diabetes is the non insulin dependent. Okay? That is the classification of diabetes in the year 1979. Now, on the year 1995, the International Expert Committee on the Diagnosis and Classification of Diabetes through the sponsorship of ADA or the American Diabetes Association revised the classifications of the diabetes. No? Well, Still the same, diabetes or type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. They use Arabic numerals instead of the Roman numerals. No? So we have type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. We also have other type of diabetes and we have the gestational diabetes. Now, the problem in type 1 diabetes mellitus is this is a uh, autoimmune autoimmune disorder. Okay? Because there is a problem in the insulin. Ano yung problem mo sa insulin? The problem in the insulin is what? Uh, destruction of the beta cells. Okay? There is a destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas. That's why there is a problem in the insulin. Destructed ang beta cells, the primary or the only cells in the pancreas that is capable to produce insulin. Okay? 
In other words, type 1, there is an absolute. Uh, this, uh, this are, these are seen in the next succeeding slides, but I will explain it now. Uh, type 1 diabetes, there is an absolute deficiency in the insulin or absolute insulin deficiency. And since there is an absolute uh, deficiency in the insulin, nangyayari? There is an increase in our glucose. Why? Why there is an increase in the glucose? Because the glucose is not metabolized. There is no hormone that will promote the entry of glucose in the cell. So the entry into the cell is inhibited because there is no hormone that will promote that. That's why what is the management? The management is to give a synthetic or a synthetic insulin. No? Ilang units ang binibigay. Depending on the severity or depending on the glucose level. Now, on the type or on type 2 diabetes mellitus, okay, this is a type of diabetes wherein the, the problem is the action of insulin. Okay? The action of insulin or there is what we call insulin secretory defect. Ibig sabihin, there can be a possibility that insulin is deficient. But not like in type 1. In type 1 kasi, there is an absolute deficiency in the insulin. In type 2, not absolute. But there is a deficiency. Okay? And if we're going to discuss type 1 diabetes, no? This is common in young or ad, uh, children. Okay? And this is the less common diabetes. While for type 2 diabetes, this is the this compromises, or com I'm sorry, that not, not compromises. Compr uh, what is the right term? Uh, the right term is yeah. This is the majority. No. Not compromises, huh? please, please disregard that. The major, uh, majority of cases is type 2 diabetes. And this is seen. No? This is seen in uh, adults. No? This is seen in adults. Okay? And other types of diabetes may be associated to secondary conditions. It's either you have a genetic defects, you have a pancreatic disease, an endocrine disease, a drug or chemically induced. Uh, I will share that. Yan. A, a drug or chemi uh, chemically induced, insulin receptor antibodies, and other genetic syndromes. Well, for gestational diabetes, what does it mean? Uh, gestational diabetes is primarily a diabetes or a type of diabetes that is seen in a pregnant woman during the early stages of pregnancy. And gestational diabetes no, is actually a metabolic and hormonal problem. No? The etiology of gestational diabetes is metabolic or hormonal problem. Okay? Now, I will go back to my pre previous slides. I've said uh, that uh, in the year 1995, there is a classification you know, of type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, other types of diabetes, and uh, gestational diabetes. Just this year, fresh, na fresh, Researches or research by Dr. De La Monte and Dr. Wands suggest that there is what we call 
type 3 diabetes. And this type 3 diabetes is accurately reflects the fact that AD or Alzheimer's disease represents a form of diabetes that is selectively involves the brain, has a molecular and biochemical features that is true with type 1 and type 2. Meaning to say, Alzheimer's disease, no, there, Alzheimer's disease is a problem. And yeah, this one. Alzheimer's disease has a characterized systematological, molecular, and biochemical abnormalities, including cell loss, abundant neurofibrillary tangles, uh, dystrophic neurosities, amyloid precursor proteins, and so on and so forth. The problem here is on the brain. No? Neurologic Alzheimer's. Nagiging makalimutin ka na. All right? In this study, they, they, they uh, include post-mortem analysis of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. That's why they were able to have a brain, histopathological of brain, or uh, yeah, the brain. And they found out uh, their human tests, you know, their samples, they found out that these patients having Alzheimer's disease has the same features of a person with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. That's why they concluded that Alzheimer's disease is the type 3 diabetes. Now, if you want to read it further, I have uploaded in our learning management system the link or the copy of the journal. I encourage you to read, to read that. Okay. Okay, so this is just a comparison of type 1 diabetes mellitus and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Okay? So onset is young and adults and type 2 middle age. Onset acute, gradual, habitus, lean, no? often obese. Yung may mga type 2. Okay, what else? We have weight loss, usual. Infrequent sa type 2. Ketosis. So, uh, bakit yung weight loss is common in, in type 1? Okay. The, the, the problem here is, napopromote ang napopromote yung pag-metabolize ng fats. No? That's why, yung stored fats, okay, ano nangyayari? Yung stored fats, na you use, naging, nag-weight nag ng loss. Ketosis usually, no, not usual in type 2. Plasma insulin concentration, low or absent in type 1. In type 2, may be normal or may be increased. Okay. Family history of diabetes, less common sa type 1 kasi autoimmune naman po ito because of the associations of the human leukocyte antigens, okay. DR, DR3, DR4, DQ2, and DQ8. Type 2 is none. Type 1 is autoantibody. Now, type 2 is more on hereditary. Okay? So, these are the laboratory findings for hyperglycemia. Increased glucose in the urine and plasma. Okay? Increased uric, uh, urine, specific gravity. Okay? Increased urine and serum osmolality. Well, I will not discuss that anymore because you all know that. Why is it possible? Ketonemia and ketonuria seen in patient with type 1. Decrease in blood uh, urine and pH because it promotes acidosis and electrolyte imbalance. Okay. Why is it an individual experience electrolyte imbalance? Because of the poly, polyuria. No, polyuria, ihi ka ng ihi. Diba? So, na-excrete na na-excrete ang ating mga urine. Uh, yeah, na-excrete na excrete ang ating urine and urine contains electrolytes. Okay? Now, 
There is what we call idiopathic type 1 diabetes. What does it mean? When we said, ah, oh, yeah, I will write. I forgot to discuss it a while ago. So we have what we call idiopathic. Uh -huh. Where is it? Idiopathic. Okay, idiopathic type 1. Diabetes. What does it mean? When we said idiopathic diabetes or idiopathic type 1 diabetes, it is a form of type 1 diabetes that has no has no etiology or known etiology. And the guys, take note, when we said etiology, it means the cause. It means the, the root, yung pinagmulan. Okay? Now, idiopathic type 1 diabetes mellitus is inherit, inherited and does not have beta cells autoimmunity. Okay? So an individual with idiopathic type 1 diabetes has a episodic requirement of insulin replacement. Okay? Insulin replacement. Okay. So again, these are the laboratory findings for hyperglycemia. Now, what are the diagnostic criteria for diabetes mellitus? How can you say? No, gusto ko tandaan nyo ito. Ha? Please remember this. Remember these values. How could we know? How could we say? How could we diagnose a patient who have diabetes? HbA1c. Take note guys that HbA1c is used for the three-month monitoring of our glucose level, or usually three years. No? Every three months, your Lolo, your Lola, your mother, or your father who have a diabetes, or if they have diabetes, every three years, uh, every three years, yeah, or every three months, the doctor is requesting for HbA1c. Okay? HbA1c is also known as the glycosylated hemoglobin, okay, which contains, no? the information about the glucose level no, of an individual. Okay. So kapag ang HbA1c is greater than or equal to 6.5%, okay, that is a criteria, a justification, or a conclusion that a patient have or has a diabetes mellitus. FPG, what do we mean by F? PG, uh, fasting plasma glucose of greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter. So, I want to make it clear. We said that greater than, no, greater than 100 mg per deciliter or DL is considered as hyperglycemic. But it doesn't mean that you are already have a diabetes mellitus. No? We can say that you have a diabetes mellitus if you have you know, all of this or one of this is true with you. Okay? Now, uh, yeah. Fasting blood sugar of greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter or equal to 7 millimoles. 2R, ano yung HPG? When we said HPG is 2R postprandial okay, or 2R plasma glucose. Greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter. And RBG, random blood sugar, or FRBS, greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Now, if you notice, OGTT is not here, no, not included as a diagnostic criteria for diabetes mellitus. I want you to remember that OGTT is not recommended for routine clinical use. Okay, OGTT is not uh, recommended for routine clinical use. Usually, OGTT is, or what, what do we mean by OGTT? Yeah, when we said OGTT, that is oral glucose tolerance test. And this is true with, no? usually, ginagawa po ito for uh, 
gestational diabetes mellitus. Okay, so again, please close your eyes and remember, HbA1c greater than or equal to 6.5%. Fasting blood sugar is greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, two hour post prandial blood glucose is greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter. Random blood sugar is greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter. Remember this. Remember. Remember. Okay, so I have here another table that will help us not to know. Is it a normal? Is it a impaired fasting? Is it a impaired glucose tolerance? Or is it diabetes mellitus? Well, the, the level of concentration here is in millimole per liter. Okay, if you want to convert it into milligrams per deciliter, you just, you just have to multiply it by 18. Okay. So we have here the samples, a fasting or fasting or a two-hour postprandial. No, and the sample includes venous plasma, venous blood, or capillary blood. Okay? So fasting, normal. You are normal if your uh, venous blood is less than 6.1. 6.1, that is actually uh, 10, 109.8. No? Uh, venous blood, 5.6 millimoles per liter. You are considered normal. Okay. Uh, less than 5.6 also for the capillary blood. Okay. Now you have an in impaired fasting glucose. If you have a fasting glucose of greater than 6.1 or less than 7.0. So meaning to say uh, 6.1 to 7.0. Okay? A 7.8 in 2 hour post prandial. And so on and so forth. Now, I, I will leave it to you. I will not explain it further because this is a self-explanatory. This is just a range. No, a diagnostic blood glucose concentration. For us to tell it as a diabetes, impaired glucose tolerance, impaired fasting glycemia, or you have normal glucose level. Okay? This is in the learning management system. I want you to have the copy of this and not just have the copy, but remember it by heart. Again, close your eyes. Greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter. Yun po ay fasting blood sugar na mayroong diabetes. Greater than or equal to 200 RBS and 2 R postprandial. Greater than or equal to 6.5% HbA1c. And these are the, th the things or the ranges that will help you to identify the condition of the patient. Again, I will put a heart here. This heart symbolizes that you have to remember it. You have the you need to have the copy of it and you have to remember it by heart. Now, what are the other criteria for testing for prediabetes? We have adults 45 years above. BMI or body mass index of greater than or equal to 25 kilograms per uh, meter square, habitual physical and active, familial history of diabetes, history of gestational diabetes, hypertension, low HDL, no? uh, elevated TAG or triglycerides. Uh, this one, wait lang. Hypertension, no, kapag po hypertension ay greater than 140 over 90 mmHg ang inyong blood pressure. If your blood pressure is normal one, uh, above 140 to 900, then you have to consider yourself as a pre-diabetic patient or you have to consider yourself 
or you subject yourself for uh, testing for glucose. Uh, low LDL, no, less than 35 milligrams per deciliter. Okay? And then elevated triglycerides is greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter. Increased in HbA1c, well, you know that, no? uh, 6.5. No, actually, actually uh, 5.7, tapat din. And PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, should be considered also for our uh, glucose analysis. Okay? So these are the categories for fasting uh, plasma glucose. So this is the normal fasting glucose, 70 to 90 milligrams per deciliter, impaired fasting glucose, 100 to 125, and professional diabetes is diagnosed at 126 or greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter. Okay? Well, well, for the oral glucose tolerance, so these are the tests that you have to remember. Again, we have here 2R post uh, 2R plasma glucose. Now, why is it 2R? You always hear 2R, 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 2R. Why is it 2R, sir? What is with 2R? Why is it you said 2R? Post prandial test. 2R plasma glucose test. Like to our serum glucose test. Why is it there is always association of two R's? Okay, the reason why is because it is seen you now after two R's, kasi, or two R's after the meal, okay, two R's after meal, glucose level should be on the normal level. No, normal dapat ang ating glucose level for two hours after meal. That's why for oral glucose tolerance view, after two hours, tingin natin, na-metabolize na ba ang ating glucose? Okay? So that's the reason why we're always saying two hours, two hours, two hours. Okay? Well, like what I've said, uh, the diagnostic criteria for diabetes mellitus associated in pregnancy or known as the gestational diabetes is the oral glucose tolerance test. Okay? There are two approaches. <coughs> Excuse me. We have one way or one step. I'm sorry, one way. One step approach and two step approach. And one way, one way, ah, I'm sorry, one step approach where you 75 grams of tawa ka ng tawa, and two-step approach, we have 100 grams, okay? Remember, this is not a diagnostic or this is not a routine test for diabetes mellitus, but rather a useful test for gestational diabetes mellitus, okay? So for the one-step approach, okay, for the one-step approach, you know, the patient consumes uh, 75 grams of glucose tolerance test, a glucose solution na uh, that is an example of a glucose solution par siyang royal na sobrang tamis no because of contain 75 grams of glucose per uh, solution now having said uh, the patient has undergo fasting for at least 8 hours no fasting for at least 8 hours and then the fasting blood glucose should be less than 92 milligrams per deciliter okay the fasting glucose must be less than, uh, I'm sorry, the fasting, yeah, yeah, the fasting plasma glucose should be less than 92 milligrams per deciliter. Why? If the result, oh, this is the explanation, if the result of your glucose tolerance test is greater than 92, greater than 180, greater than 153, then this is a diagnostic characteristic of gestational diabetes mellitus. Okay. So let's say for example, I will give example. Let's say for example, 
Uh, the fasting glucose level is 105. Uh, and after fasting, the patient will consume the glucose solution. And after consuming the glucose solution after an hour, no, the result is 200. And another an hour, no, the result is 170. Well, you might you might observe or you might wonder why is it sir there is an increase after one hour no after the fasting blood sugar you collect it under another an hour after an hour tapos biglang tumaas because you consume glucose na consume ka ng glucose eh kaya tumaas yan now if the result is like this 105 200 170 it means that you have the gestational diabetes mellitus any abnormality among these three is a suge suggest no suggest that a patient has or have a problem no in their glucose metabolism okay now if the result is less than 92 let's say for example 80 um, 175 140, then it is normal. Okay? Free from gestational diabetes. Now I have a question. Well, I, I know even though that I will ask question, you, you cannot answer and I can't give your answer, but I will ask you a question. Let's say for example that the result is this. Okay. So the fasting blood sugar is 107 milligrams per deciliter. And after consuming, so after the extraction, the patient will be asked to consume glucose solution. And after an hour, the one, after an hour, 178 ang plasma glucose. And after another an hour, 200. Is this unacceptable? The answer is no. No. The answer is no. The answer is no. This is not acceptable. Why? Because if you will observe, no, if you will observe, our plasma glucose decreases as time increases. Okay? For this two. For this two. Bumaba dapat. Kasi naka two hours ka na. Kaya bumaba dapat. In this case, after an hour of consuming the glucose tolerance solution, your glucose level is 178. And after another hour, mas tumaas pa, it is impossible. But if this is 107, this is 200, this is 178, then it is acceptable. Okay? Then, now you have to be conscious on what you are doing. Let's say for example, ganito yung nangyari, 200 after 2 hours, mas mataas pa sa first hour, then the, what is the decision? Repeat. Repeat. Why do you have to repeat? This is not acceptable. The ob will be will get mad if the result is like this. Okay? Now, how about for the two-step approach? For the two-step approach, so basically, uh, you will have 100 grams. Now, for this time, you have at least 8 to 14 hours of fasting. Now, take note, guys. Why he said 8 to, uh, eight to, 10, uh, 8 to 14 hours of fasting? So, di ba over fasting na yan? Kasi sabi natin, 8 to 10 hours lang ang fasting for glucose. Is it over fasting? 14 hours. Why 14 hours? Let's say, for example, this one. The patient undergo 10 hours of fasting. Okay? We will, or she will consume glucose solution. We'll have another hour of fasting. We'll have another hour of fasting. We'll have another hour of, hour of fasting. That is actually 13 hours of fasting already. Okay? So basically, the same thing as this one. The glucose level should be uh, decreases as time of 
uh, as the time increases. No? So again, you have to be careful on releasing the results. No? And you have to remember, again, this one. 92, 180, 153. 75. Oh, natin dito. 75, 92, 180, 153. 100, 92, 180, 155, 140. Okay? Remember. Remember. Now, OGTT. How are we going to perform OGTT? Okay? A uh, patient should eat normal diet containing at least, no, no, wala yung tea, at least 250 milligrams. No? 250 milligrams. Before, before, 150 lang. No? This time, one, 250 grams. Ha? Tandaan. Grams of carbohydrates per day for at least three days prior to testing. Again, the patient must have a fasting for at least 8 to, 10, uh, 8 to 14 hours. It should be on basal state. I, I, I am sure, I, I guess, I was able to explain it why on basal state. Before, no? uh, smoking is not allowed, it's prohibited. Okay? Drinking water is allowed. Okay? Drinking water is allowed. Okay, so what do we mean by hypoglycemia? Okay? Hypoglycemia is a condition naman wherein there is a decreased level of plasma glucose. Okay? And the decrease in the plasma glucose may be transient or relatively insignificant. However, even though that this is a relatively insignificant for some, now this can be a life-threatening. Okay? Why life-threatening? Because hypoglycemia causes uh, brain fuel deprivation. Kaya na sinabi natin kanina, no, kapag na, pag mababa yung level ng glucose in the extracellular fluid, that is the only source ng metabolism ng energy ng brain ng neurons, ng nervous system. Wala siyang napagkukunan. Na-alter ang ating function. Okay? So, hypoglycemia causes brain fuel deprivation. And brain fuel deprivation will lead into what? Impaired uh, judgment, impaired behavior, seizures, coma, functional brain failure, and even death. Kaya yung pang mga pasyente na sila po ay hyperglycemic, hyperglycemic sila. Okay? Hyperglycemic sila who eventually develop hypoglycemia as a life-threatening condition. Nagko-collapse, nawawala ng malay, nakokomatose. Bakit? Wala ng ultimate source of energy. Why is it this thing happen? Hypoglycemia may be due to treatment or biological factors. Treatment, overdose of insulin. Okay, it is not recommended for you to overdose the insulin. Naku, kumain ako ng madami. Ang galing kang fiestahan. You eat a lot of carbohydrates. You eat a lot of sugar. Kumain ka ng sampung bandihadong kanin. Kumain ka ng madaming minatamis. No? Sabi mo, okay lang. I have, I have drugs with you. I have insulin. I'm taking insulin. In just one shot, 12 units of insulin, my glucose will be normalized. Eh, paano pag na-overdose ka ng insulin? Ano naman yung gagawin ng overdosing of insulin? Aba, eh, pwede ka naman mamatay doon. Makukumatose ka. Just because of overdose in insulin. Okay? Kaya pag hindi ka doktor, pag mong i-adjust yung level ng insulin na binibigay. Okay, insulin is given in uh, insulin is given as subcutaneous. No? Binibigay siya subcutaneous. Okay. Now hypoglycemia, di ba sabi natin 50 to 55 milligrams per deciliter. If the glucose level is on this level, 50 to 55, aba, take, take lang. There is a problem. If the result of your patient, ng glucose niya, analysis of glucose is 50 to 55, you don't have to wait before the release or before, or you don't have to wait na. You don't have to uh, print the result. Uh, uh, you don't have to print the result. What I mean is, hindi mo na kailangang intayin pang i-print mo yung result just to let the doctor or the nurse on duty to be informed that the glucose level is 50 to 55. 
If the result is like this, it is your moral obligation to inform immediately the doctor, to inform immediately the nurse on duty, to inform the doctor that the result is like this. And you have to release it immediately because this is a danger of hypoglycemia. If the level of glucose, if the glucose level is set at this level, there is a possibility anytime soon that the patient is experiencing, will experience or is experiencing seizures or eventually lead to comatose that can lead into death. That's why if the level of the glucose level, and now if the level of the glucose level, if the level of glucose is at 70 milligrams per deciliter, you have to alert already. Okay? You have to be, you have to alert no? individuals already. Now, there are classifications of hypoglycemia. We have severe hypoglycemia. We have documented sim symptomatic hypoglycemia. We have asymptomatic hypoglycemia. We have probable symptomatic hypoglycemia. And lastly, we have pseudo hypoglycemia. Okay? So, what is this? When we said severe hypoglycemia, it requires assistance to actively administer carbohydrate and glycogen to take other corrective actions. Now, when we said documented symptomatic hypoglycemia, uh, symptoms of hypoglycemia, no, nakikita. Ano ba yung mga symptoms of, of hypoglycemia? Yun nga. Uh, what are the symptoms? I, I forgot. Wait. The symptoms of hypoglycemia includes uh, flaccid, paralysis, no? nalalambot ka. Okay. You, feel, you feel that you don't have energy at all. Okay. Uh, plasma glucose, less than 50. Then symptoms relieved by correcting the hypoglycemia with administering glucose or glucagon. No, kaya pag kaya pag sabi, nako nagkamaran siya ng hypoglycemia, biglang bumagsak ang kanyang glucose level. Ano yung sinasabi ng iba? Give him or her coke. Give him or her uh, uh, sweets. Bakit? That, that will help to relieve the hypoglycemia. Okay. Symptoms of hypoglycemia includes, ito na, I, I, I remember na. Symptoms of glycemia includes uh, ano ngayon? Hunger. Yeah. Hunger. Pagkagutom. Eh sir, paano yun? Lagi akong gutom. Patay tayo dyan. Hunger. Uh, sweating. Next, uh, nausea and vomiting. Bakit po nausea and vomiting? Wala nang nourishment ang brain. Nahihirapan na siya. Uh, dizziness, nahihilo ka na din. What else? Uh, blurring of speech. No, I have classmate nung, nung high school. Hindi naman siya hypoglycemic, pero blur ang speech niya. No, blurring of speech. What else? Blurring of speech, hunger, sweaty, nausea, and vomiting, dizziness, uh, Yeah. Mental confusions. Okay. Mental confusions and shaking. Yan. Nangangatal ka na. Kasi wala ka ng glucose sa katawan. Wala ka ng energy sa katawan. Okay, going back. When we said asymptomatic hypoglycemia, no, measured plasma glucose concentration less than or equal to 70 mg per deciliter. No, almost the same with documented symptomatic hypoglycemia. Well, what is the difference? The difference is just in symptomatic, nakikita mo itong mga to. Blaring of speech, hunger, sweating, nausea, dizziness, mental confusion, shaking, and vomiting. In the symptomatic, you have plasma glucose level of less than 70 mg per deciliter, but you don't have symptoms. Okay. Now, how about probable symptomatic hypoglycemia? There is a symptoms typically to hypoglycemia. 
no, no plasma glucose determination is performed. Akala mo lang. Probable. Because you will experience the uh, symptoms of hypoglycemia. And lastly, we have pseudo-hypoglycemia. Okay. When you said pseudo-hypoglycemia, you have the symptoms. Okay. You have the symptoms, but your glucose level is greater than 70 milligrams. Okay. Greater than 70 milligrams. Now, I have here the algorithm for the investigation of hypoglycemia. Okay. So, history suggests hypoglycemia. Okay. Ano yung gagawin natin? If we have this type of condition, what are the things that we have to consider? Then you have to document the hypoglycemia. I'm sorry. This one should be document. Okay. Document the hypoglycemia. Okay. Now, the hypoglycemia may be due to fasting hypoglycemia or reactive hypoglycemia. Okay. Let's discuss first fasting hypoglycemia. Let's say, for example, you have undergone a fasting and your, uh, your plasma glucose is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter then you have what we call fasting glycemia. Now, what to do? If you have a fasting hypoglycemia, then we have to measure the insulin and C-peptide. Okay? There are three possible conditions or scenarios. Both insulin and C-peptide is increased. Okay? That is what we call endogenous hyperinsulinism. Bakit po Mataas ang insulin at saka ang C-peptide, there is an islet cell tumor. Okay? That mimics the production of our, or the synthesis of our insulin. Or, there is a drug-induced or anti-insulin antibodies. Okay? So kapag increase ang insulin, both insulin and C-peptide, is increased, then it is a condition no, that suggests endogenous hyperinsulinism pataas ang ating insulin due to three conditions. Number one, because of the islet cell tumor. Number two, because of the drug-induced or anti-insulin antibodies. Another scenario is both insulin and C-peptide is decreased. What, will, what is the condition? Suppress endogenous insulin secretion. The problem, liver disease, chronic kidney disease, non-islet tumor, endocrine deficiency, drug-induced, alcohol-induced, severe starvation. Now, let's say, for example, insulin is increased, but our C-peptide is decreased. Uh, exogenous insulin, anti-insulin receptor antibodies. Now, what about reactive hypoglycemia? Okay. When we said reactive hypoglycemia, it can be drug-induced. Okay. Uh, most patients with type 1 diabetes experience occasional episodes of hypoglycemia. Why? Because of the attempt to attain the optimum glycemic control because of the effect of the insulin. Okay? So, yun po yung ibig sabihin natin ng reactive hypoglycemia. Well, in the type, in case of type 2 diabetes, hypoglycemia can be a complication naman of the treatment. Okay? Hypoglycemia in type 2 is due to the complication of the treatment, particularly tolbutamide, if you still remember, in our discussion in clinical microscopy, tulbutamide that contains sulfonylureas, uh, sulfonylureas, okay? Uh, okay, so that is the re reactive. If this is not associated with meals, is it a drug-related? If this is uncertain, then we have to measure C-peptide. Now, 
if this is drug related then we should have a definitive uh, evidences okay again maybe due to the uh, treatment example is sulfur uh, tulbotamide no uh, which contains sulfonyl sulfonyl ureas now if this is associated with males then we have to consider it is it an adult no or infant if adult then consider mixed meal tolerance test if cause is in doubt now if infants investigate for inherited metabolic diseases now this inherited metabolic diseases ay ano naman yung mga yan uh, i have here yan no that is transient neonatal hypoglycemia it can be due to hyperinsulinemia the problem if you have hyperinsulinemia is uh, insulinoma no the uh, malignancy in the pancreas no is that hyperplasia inherited metabolic disorders okay we have glycogen storage disease you have galactosemia you have hereditary fructose uh, intolerance fatty acid beta oxidation defects and you have uh, other causes. It can be due to prematurity, endocrine disorder, starvation, drugs, uh, ketotic, or hypoglycemic. I'm sorry, uh, ketotic hypoglycemic. Okay, so these are the genetic defects in the carbohydrate metabolism. Number one is we have the G6 speed deficiency okay, or G6. Uh, glucose 6-phosphate deficiency. This is one of the metabolic diseases that is seen or that is tested in the uh, newborn screening. No, uh, Glucose 6-phosphate deficiency is also known as uh, von Gerg's disease. Take note guys that this is an autosomal recessive disease. This disease is characterized by uh, severe hypoglycemia with metabolic acidosis and ketonemia, okay? Elevated lactate and aniline. Yeah? Uh, glycogen cannot be converted back to glucose by the way of hepatic glyco glycogenolysis. That's why there is a elevated or severe hypoglycemia, okay? Liver biopsy of a patient with glucose 6-phosphate deficiency is positive for glycogen stains. Okay? Ano po yung glycogen stains na ginagamit natin? FAS. Okay? Periodic acid shift. That is, that is a carbohydrate stain at magbibigay ng brown color sa glycogen at, uh, not brown, I'm sorry, pink color sa glycogen natin if the liver biopsy is stained with periodic acid shift. Next is we have Galactosemia, this is a deficiency in galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. No? It occurs in the inhibition of the glyconylogysis. That's why there is also what we call hypoglycemia. Now, what are the methods of glucose measurement? We have uh, serum, plasma, or whole blood as our sample. Now, I want you to take note, guys, that glucose in the whole blood is 11% lower than the glucose in the plasma. Okay? That's why uh, whole blood as a sample for POCT is not that uh, significant. No, yung mga glucometer, hmm? nasabi ko sa inyo, yung mga POCT na yan, if you don't know how to interpret, tigil-tigilan nyo na lang. Yeah. Uh, for, group, for plasma, then we have to use gray top no, that contains sodium fluoride, an additive sodium fluoride that will prevent the breakdown of the glucose. Now, uh, for serum, no, we have to take note that it must be refrigerated no, in order to prevent the uh, breakdown of the glucose. However, even though that it is refrigerated, no, we have the uh, metabolism of glucose. I don't know if I was, I was, uh, uh, I was able to mention this to you, but yeah, for the purpose of this discussion, take note, guys, that glucose no, 
if the sample is serum, you have to separate agad the plasma or the serum and the whole blood. The serum and the red cell. Why? Because if you will store your sample no, in refrigerated temperature, the glucose metabolism is 2 milligrams per deciliter per hour. And if you're going to store it at ref, no, hindi mo siya pinireserve, ang glucose metabolism is 7 milligrams per deciliter per hour. So that is the problem. That is the, the condition. If you will not test it agad, so even though you test, uh, you, even though you refrigerate it, there's still a metabolism. That's why it is recommended to test immediately, no, our sample. Okay, the fasting requirement is eight to ten hours for the glucose determination. Now we have here methods of glucose measurement. It is divided into two. We have the chemical methods and we have the enzymatic methods. Well, I will not discuss the laboratory test here no, in lecture, but I will discuss this, this in, in our laboratory. No? I will give you a pre-recorded lecture about the test for the glucose measurement. And we will discuss it also in our laboratory. Okay? So I have here drugs that will help us to uh, hypoglycemic drugs. Okay. Again, this is just a summary of the drugs. Now, I will also give a brief discussion on this on the next video about the hypoglycemic agents. Okay, so that's the end. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. And I hope that you were able to learn in this video, even though uh, very lengthy or very long ang ating discussion about carbohydrate.